Good day to one and all, and welcome to part 45 of Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History. Now, since we're still well into antiquity, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to do a less historical or chronological talk and do something more thematically based today, where I'll be jumping all over the place. So please forgive me in advance if this seems a bit more disorganized than usual. Uh, I recently haven't had as much time to work on my lectures, but uh, I still think we're going to cover a lot of useful ground. And so my theme today is something which will become increasingly more and more important to the overall history of Hermeticism, and that is the theme of the out-of-body experience, or at least how this was interpreted and related in ancient literature. Now, it doesn't matter if you're Ishtar, Odysseus, Aeneas, Heracles, Orpheus, Paul of Tarsus, Apuleius, Muhammad, Dante, or whatever, when you left your body, you went on a relatively standardized journey, either to Hades, the Catabasis, the downward journey, or to the heavenly spheres above, the Anabasis, the upward journey, or both. Uh, it, it seems to me that both was more often the case than not. Jesus, as the archetypal hero, does this on the cross after he undergoes kenosis. That is, he empties himself and he goes down into the vaults of Sheol, in what's traditionally called the harrowing of hell. Then, at the ascension, he undergoes the anabasis. Ar arguably, this happens at other points too, such as on the Mount of Transfiguration. But you can find this stuff a lot in mystical Jewish Hecalot literature, uh, which eventually fed into Kabbalah. You'll find this in all the Gnostic Ogdoatic Ascent literature. This is literature concerning the eight spheres, or layers of creation, such as the eighth reveals the ninth, and that sort of stuff that we get in the Nag Hammadi library. Now, there's very evidently a common thread running through all of these narratives, and this is something I think is worth exploring. Uh, mind you, I don't plan on going full Blavatsky and telling you that this is the hidden revelation of the Ascended Masters and their septenary system or anything like that. Uh, if that's the kind of thing that you're looking for, you, you can just go straight to the secret doctrine and get it from the horse's mouth. Uh, I will, however, be getting close <laughs> with casting historicity to the wind and getting a little bit comparative. And uh, I know that's not fashionable anymore in the history of religions, but whatever, this is more for the occultists in the audience. Now, my plan was to do this all in one lecture, but I realized there was just too much to go through on account of this subject to do it all in one part. So I've decided to break it up into two sections, one on catabasis, that is descent into the underworld, and one on anabasis, ascent into the heavens. So we'll start with catabasis. The term catabasis, and likewise its opposite, comes from ancient Greek, and that's the word kata, which is down, and bino, which is I go. So, kata bino, I go down. It's a word that has a lot of uses, and some are far more mundane, like a walk down to the market, or a march up country, such as the case in Xenophon's Anabasis into Persia. Now, that being said, sometimes this word is used in a less mundane sense, and that's when it carries the connotation of a descent into the underworld. So, in the case of Plato's Republic, Right in the opening scene, uh, Socrates recounts how he went down, the verb is katebane, I went down, uh, to the port city of Piraeus, located just south of Athens. For Plato, it was as if leaving that beacon of civilization called Athens was nothing more than a journey into hell, or at the very least, a step outside of nomos, uh, out of law, and into fusis, into nature, which is a false dichotomy, by the way. 
Now, my hunch, and I've been thinking about this intensely for years, is that the motif of the catabasis stretches back into pre-agricultural times, into shamanic times. The catabasis was synonymous with the low point of a quest for understanding. And I think this idea first came about from shamanic initiations, uh, from spirit or vision quests, if you will, where individuals were put into altered states of consciousness, whether by dance or drug or exhaustion or fasting or incubation or self-mutilation or, or all of the above. And now, on account of this seemingly hypernatural phenomenon, people started to map out inner space. The similarity between death and ecstasy, that is, standing outside of oneself, wasn't lost on the ancients. In, in uh, Greco-Roman mythologies, heroes such as Aeneas, Orpheus, and Odysseus, as we'll see, they all performed katabases, or descents, where they communed with the earth, or the plant world, so for example, some kind of blood sacrifice, or the golden bough, and uh, on account of their virtue, they were given power to transect worlds with the risk of never returning. Mircea Iliade called this the uh, rupture of planes. Now, my belief in regards to this catabasis motif was, in all probability, the poetic result of an attempt to render, into words, the old shamanic practice of incubation, in a cave or otherwise, in, in pursuit of an out-of-body experience, or, I don't know, an inward journey to the lands of the dead, or the ancestors, or the land of the spirits. This is where people explore their inner psyches, and this is what gives people the ability to literally map heaven and hell. And the resulting literature is brilliant, and it's all over the place. So, if you were to ask me, uh, did Dante really go to hell, I think in his mind's eye, he really did. And I also think he was preceded by many a man he meets along the way. Now, here's what he tells us in the opening lines of the Inferno. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark. This, of course, being the dark night of the soul. For the straightforward pathway had been lost. Ah me, how hard a thing it is to say, what was this forest savage, rough and stern, which in the very thought renews the fear? So bitter is it, death is little more. But of the good to treat which there I found, speak will I of the other things I saw there. I cannot well repeat how there I entered, so full was I of slumber at the moment in which I had abandoned the true way. Now, this notion of maps of heaven and hell, these were first experienced, then vulgarized, if you will. Uh, they were compressed into recognizable words, then extended into people's minds through complex myths. The descent into hell became an integral part of the archetypical hero's journey, uh, which has been recapitulated over and over in so many ways. But what this signifies for everyone then, that is, when approached from a psychological perspective, is that the journey to the underworld is a journey into a basal state of consciousness. One steps down into pure chaos. One is dismembered. One is tormented by one's past actions. One is drunk on forgetfulness or harangued by furies, and one has got to stitch oneself back together. This part of the journey is the dark night of the soul, Dante's forest dark, 
when the pole of the infernal dimensions is stronger than those of the celestial, uh, rather than in balance, where it is necessary for the weary soul to make the hero's journey back to the land of the living, lest he become one among the powerless gibbering shades. Now, here's the thing. Crisis can come about naturally, or it can be simulated. Dante was by no means the first whose mind was freed to map hell. Uh, through all kinds of shamanic techniques that I just listed, one can be hurled headlong into short-term, one-man micro-crisis with relative ease, and then ignite a sort of personal eschaton where the floodgates of dreams is opened up, and one is forced to swim in its torrential floods and whirling eddies. You know, no initiate ventured past the gates of a mystery school with the expectation of having a good party. Unless, of course, they were looking to profane the mysteries. When Apuleius's character, Lucius, in his novel called The Metamorphosis, is confronted by a priest about his initiation rites into the cult of Isis, he answers, The gates of hell and the power of life are in the hands of the goddess, and the very act of dedication is regarded as a voluntary death and an imperiling of life. In retelling his initiation, he tells of his own descent into hell, but also subsequently into the heavens. You need both for the whole experience. And I quote, Listen then, but believe, for what I tell you is the truth. I came to the boundary of death, and after treading Proserpine's threshold, I returned, having traversed all the elements. At midnight, I saw the sun shining with brilliant light. I approached the gods below and the gods above, face to face, and I worshipped them in their actual presence. Now, I've told you what, though you have heard it, you cannot know. Now, I should probably mention that out-of-body experiences provoked by an overdose of hallucinogenic or delirient substances uh, can appear indistinguishable from the hallucinations onset by life-threatening fevers, bouts of temporary psychosis, extreme exhaustion, and near-death experiences. Because ultimately, we are drugs. We are drugs. There's no such thing as doing it on the natch because we are drugs. All right. Now, long before the introduction of alcohol, ecstatic specialists had available to themselves all manner of plants and fungi with oracular properties. So they had various hallucinogenic mushrooms, uh, Amanita muscaria, and possibly various types of coprophilic psilocybin-containing mushrooms, uh, opium, jimson weed, that is, datura, mandrake root, cannabis, uh, deadly nightshade, henbane, various ruse and DMT containing reeds, shrubs, and trees, uh, or even combinations of all of these things. Uh, all of these can be used to trigger a personal catabasis or anabasis, and I really think we can't overstate the importance of these things as a catalyst for visionary states. These are not the sine qua non of the experience, but they're the easiest way to reach them. You know, why learn to walk on water when the boatman charges you a penny? Now, that being said, there was obviously knowledge that these sorts of states could be achieved by other means. Plato's myth of Ur, uh, that is, in the Republic, in Book 10, lines 614 to 621, uh, this features a kind of philosophical 
Katabasis narrative wherein a man has a near-death experience during a battle and then suddenly awakes ten days later atop his own funeral pyre, just about to be burned. Now, during his journeys through the afterlife, Ur finds himself immersed in a strikingly DMT-like metaphysical dream world with four giant portals, uh, two above and two below, where the disembodied souls of the dead were accordingly being sent off to dwell. Uh, now, the fear of death would have been ever-present for an initiate launched into states of overwhelming intoxication or extreme fasting, and uh, leading up to an out-of-body experience, the process of self-dissolution can be unbearable, especially among those who resist the experience. In such experiences, a shaman or a priest often acts as a psychopomp or guide for the dying or ecstatic soul. Uh, this became absorbed into the literary tradition in the form of all kinds of gods and guides. But in any case, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, as the Emerald Tablet's axiom goes, that which is above is onto that which is below, and vice versa. The shamanic experience, the personal eschaton, gleans truth about the hidden psyche of man, that symbolic hidden inner life, but it also acts as a map or a cosmological model for explaining the construction of the universe, the, the lesser man writ large. Now, I'm going to read you an English translation of one of the oldest extant catabasis stories ever carved into clay. And this is a Babylonian slash Akkadian account of Ishtar's descent, who was uh, first the Sumerian Inanna. And remember, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a symbol is worth a thousand pictures. These myths operate on numerous levels. I don't want to say that this is the mother of all stories, uh, but it definitely has its echoes throughout the Mediterranean world's mystery traditions, from the Orphic myths, to the rape of Persephone, to the fall of Sophia and Gnosticism, to the emanation of God in the material world through the Sephirot, and so on and so forth. Uh, the soul falls into the underworld that is matter, or the sensible, and then it makes for its inevitable return. So... Here we go. The Descent of the Goddess Ishtar into the Lower World. Uh, this is a very old translation. It's done by uh, Morris Jastrow in 1915. To the land of no return, the land of darkness, Ishtar, the daughter of Sin, the moon, directed her thought to the House of Shadows, the dwelling of Erkala, that's Hades, to the house without exit for him who enters therein, to the road whence there is no turning, to the house without light for him who enters therein, the place where dust is their nourishment, clay their food. They have no light, in darkness they dwell, clothed like birds with wings as garments, over door and bolt dust has gathered. Ishtar, on arriving at the gate of the land of no return, to the gatekeeper thus addressed herself. Gatekeeper, ho, open thy gate, open thy gate that I may enter. If thou openest not the gate to let me enter, I will break the door, I will wrench the lock, I will smash the doorposts, I will force the doors, and I will bring the dead to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. The gatekeeper opened his mouth and spoke, spoke to the Lady Ishtar. Desist 
O oh lady, do not destroy it. I will go and announce thy name to my queen, Eresh Kigal, the Earth Mother. The gatekeeper entered and spoke to Eresh Kigal. Ho, here is my sister, Ishtar, hostility of the great powers. Where Eresh Kigal heard this, and there's uh, some lacunas here. When Eresh Kigal heard this, as one hews down a tamarisk, she trembled. As one cuts a reed, she shook. What has moved her heart, which is the seat of the intellect? What has stirred her liver, which is the seat of the emotions? Ho oh, there, does this one wish to dwell with me? To eat clay as food, to drink dust as wine? I weep for the men who have left their wives. I weep for the wives torn from the embrace of their husbands. For the little ones cut off before their time. Go, gatekeeper, open thy gate for her. Deal with her according to ancient decree. The gatekeeper went and opened his gate to her. Enter, O lady. Let Kutha greet thee. Let the palace of the land of no return rejoice at thy presence. So, here's where the narrative concerning the seven gates begin. Uh, these would later be known as uh, archons or rulers, um, but it's easiest to conceive of these things as the seven visible planets, which, again, are uh, symbolic of the universe's intellectual filing cabinets. They're like first principles, although more than one principle is an oxymoron. Um, some of you might detect similarities to the chakras in terms of the placement of the objects being removed uh, from the Ajna crown to the Muladhara loincloth, uh, but ultimately what's happening is that the goddess is stripping away her raiment and fineries and, ironically, changing from a subtler to a grosser state. He bade her enter the first gate, which he opened wide, and took the large crown off her head. Why, O gatekeeper, dost thou remove the large crown off my head? Enter, O lady, such are the decrees of Eresh Kigal. The second gate he bade her enter, opening it wide, and removed her earrings. Why, O gatekeeper, dost thou remove my earrings? Enter, O lady, for such are the decrees of Eresh Kagal. The third gate he bade her enter, and opened it wide and removed her necklace. Why, O gatekeeper, dost thou remove my necklace? Enter, O lady, for such are the decrees of Eresh Kagal. The fourth gate he bade her enter, opened it wide, and removed the ornaments of her breast. Why, O oh gatekeeper, dost thou remove the ornaments of my breast? Enter, O oh lady, for such are the decrees of Eresh Kagal. The fifth gate he bade her enter, opened it wide, and removed the girdle from her body studded with birthstones. Why, O oh gatekeeper, dost thou remove the girdle from my body, studded with birthstones? Enter, O oh lady, for such are the decrees of Eresh Kagal. The sixth gate he bade her enter, opened it wide, and removed the spangles off her hands and feet. Why, O oh gatekeeper, dost thou remove the spangles off my hands and feet? Enter, O oh lady. For thus are the decrees of Eresh Kigal. The seventh gate he bade her enter, opened it wide, and removed her loincloth. Why, O gatekeeper, dost thou remove my loincloth? Enter, 
O lady, for such are the decrees of Ereshkigal. Now, when Ishtar had gone down into the land of no return, Ereshkigal saw her and was angered at her presence. Ishtar, without reflection, threw herself at her in rage. Ereshkigal opened her mouth and spoke. To Namtar, her messenger, she addressed herself. Go, Namtar, imprison her in my palace. Send against her sixty diseases to punish Ishtar. Eye diseases against her eyes, diseases of the side against her side, foot disease against her foot, heart disease against her heart, head disease against her head, against her whole being, against her entire body. After the Lady Ishtar had gone down into the land of no return, the bull did not mount the cow. The ass approached not the she-ass. To the maid in the street no man drew near. The man slept in his apartment. The maid slept by herself. The second half of the poem, uh, the reverse of the tablet, continues as follows. The countenance of Popsukal, the messenger of the great gods, fell. His face was troubled. In mourning garb he was clothed, in soiled garments clad. Shamash, the sun god, went to Sin, the moon god, his father weeping. In the presence of Ea, the king, he went with flowing tears. Ishtar has descended into the earth and has not come up. The bull does not mount the cow. The ass does not approach the she-ass. The man does not approach the maid in the street. The man sleeps in his apartment, and the maid sleeps by herself. Ea, in the wisdom of his heart, formed a being. He formed Asushu-Namir, the eunuch. Go, Asushu-Namir, to the land of no return direct thy face. The seven gates of the land without return be opened before thee. May Ereshkigal at the sight of thee rejoice. After her heart has been assuaged, her liver quieted, invoke against her the name of the great gods. Raise thy head, direct thy attention to the Kalziku skin. Come, lady, let them give me the Kalziku skin, that I may drink water out of it. When Ereshkigal heard this, she struck her side, bit her finger. Thou hast expressed a wish that cannot be granted. Go, Asus Bu Yamir, I curse thee with a great curse. The sweepings of the gutters of the city be thy flood. The drains of thy city be thy drink. The shadow of the wall be thy abode. The threshold be thy dwelling place. May drunkard and sot strike thy cheek. Ereshkigal opened her mouth and spoke. To Namtar, her messenger, she addressed herself. Go, Namtar, knock at the strong palace. Strike the threshold of precious stones. Bring out the Anunnaki, those from on high. Seat them on golden thrones. Sprinkle Ishtar with the waters of life. Sprinkle Ishtar with the waters of life and take her out of my presence. Namtar went, knocked at the strong palace, tapped on the threshold of precious stones. He brought out the Anunnaki and placed them on golden thrones. He sprinkled Ishtar with the waters of life and took hold of her. Through the first gate he led her out and returned her her loincloth. Through the second gate he led her out and returned her the spangles of her hands and feet. Through the third gate he led her out and returned her the girdle of her body, studded with birthstones. Through the fourth gate he led her out and returned to her the ornaments of her breast. Through the fifth gate, he led her out and returned to her her necklace. Through the sixth gate, he led her out and returned her earrings. 
Through the seventh gate he led her out and returned to her the large crown for her head. Uh, the following lines are in the form of an address, apparently to someone who has sought release for a dear one from the portals of the lower world. If she, Ishtar, will not grant thee her release, to Tammuz, the lover of her youth, pour out pure waters, pour out fine oil. With a festival garment, deck him that he may play on the flute of lapis lazuli, that the votaries may cheer his liver. Belili, the sister of Tammuz, had gathered the treasure with precious stones filled her bosom. When Belili heard the lament of her brother, she dropped her treasure. She scattered the precious stones before her. Oh, my only brother, do not let me perish. On the day when Tammuz plays for me on the flute of lapis lazuli, playing it for me with the porphyry ring, together with him play ye for me, ye weepers and lamenting women, that the dead may rise up and inhale the incense. Now, with this uh, little addendum aside, uh, there's obviously going to be all kinds of interpretations for this story. Uh, it's a cute fairy tale, it's a spiritual allegory, it's an etiological myth about the cycle of death and rebirth inherent in nature, and so on and so forth. Uh, what makes myths and symbols great is that they operate on many levels. They're polysemic. Now, historically speaking, this was probably intended as an ideological myth over the cycle of the seasons. But I think over centuries of elaboration, local variation, philosophical analysis, and so forth, these stories were recognized for their ability to initiate people into the very mysteries of existence. Uh, this is why the mysteries of Zagreus and the Titans, of Isis and Osiris, of Persephone and Demeter, of Attis and Kabylie, and so on and so forth, they all tap into aspects of this Ur-narrative. If you want a really good Neoplatonic reading of this mystery school material, uh, you'd best be looking into the works of Julian the Apostate, who had all manner of in-depth analyses on the subject matter of the mother of all the gods. Now, jumping out of chronological order, and I'll come back to some more ancient narratives later, uh, I want to read you something from the New Testament to see how, over millennia, uh, this myth was vulgarized and transformed into a spiritual allegory, a Nostos narrative, that is, a narrative about the return home when the Atma, or the world soul, uh, the god above god of which we are all but facets, makes a journey into the abyss, into the phenomenal world, to find out who and what it was all along before returning to the Pleroma, the fullness. It's about the oscillation between the one and the many, uh, as if the universe was playing hide-and-seek with itself, climbing up and down the tree of life out from the world of pure potentiality into the ever-shifting and corruptible realm of actuality and, and back. So, here it goes. And if anybody is familiar with the myth of the pearl, uh, I want you to keep that one especially in mind when we read this. Uh, I want you to see behind the mundaneness of this particular account. The Parable of the Lost Son Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, where he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went, and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who set him up in his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and, and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran out to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called out to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. The brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. Now, this is one of those stories in the New Testament, along with the allegory of the lost sheep and a number of others involving deaths, which are often used to argue in favor of Gnostic transvaluation, that is, the inversion of morals, also known in the occult circles as the left-hand path. But here I'm drawing attention to the soteriological dimension. I was lost, but now... I'm found. Now, throughout the history of the West, as people's dualistic conceptions intensified at the expense of more monist visions of the world, their need to be saved from something likewise grew. Language the discovery of the mind, the proliferation of religion and philosophy, uh, this was the gradual hypostasis of the great one thing, which separated us, alienated us, and made us long for a blessed fatherland or a new Eden. The larger the chasm appeared between the imminent and the transcendent, the more fervently the world conceived of itself in terms of a lost child. Lost in a cave with shadows on the wall. And the more lost people felt in the world, the more stories they told about a soul that fell from the state of perfection and was saved in the end. We gradually turned the earth into more and more of a hell, and our need to be saved from it proportionally grew. By late antiquity, most pagans and Christians alike were fully entrenched in this vision of the world, uh, 
Even Homer's Odyssey was reinterpreted as an allegory of the soul's journey into manifestation, then back toward the One. Uh, one of the most popular myths, which primed Greek consciousness for this mode of thinking, was at the heart of the Eleusinian mysteries. And that, of course, was the story of Demeter and Persephone. Now, I think the only way that I can do this justice is by reading you an English translation of the Homeric hymn, uh, but I'm going to try to give you an abridged version because it's rather long and uh, for some reason, there's a bunch of untranslated Greek words in this particular translation of the text. So I'll tell you what they are as I go, uh, unless the specific word slips my memory. So here we go. I begin to sing of Demeter, the holy goddess with the beautiful hair, and her daughter Persephone, too, the one with delicate ankles, whom Hades seized. She was given away by Zeus, the loud thunderer, the one who sees far and wide. Demeter did not take part in this, she of the golden double axe, she who glories in the harvest. Persephone was having a good time along with the daughters of Okeanos, who wear their girdles slung low. She was picking flowers, roses, crocus, and the beautiful violets, up and down the soft meadow. Iris blossoms, too, she picked, and hyacinth, and the narcissus, which was grown as a lure for the flower-faced girl by Gaia. All according to the plans of Zeus. She, Gaia, was doing a favor for the one who receives many guests, Hades. It, the Narcissus, was a wonderful thing in its splendor. To look at it gives a sense of holy awe to the immortal gods as well as to mortal humans. It has a hundred heads growing up from the root, its sweet fragrance spread over the wide sky up above, and the earth below smiled back in all its radiance. So too the churning mass of the salty sea. She, Persephone, was filled with a sense of wonder, and she reached out with both hands to take hold of the pretty plaything, and the earth full of roads leading every which way, opened up under her. It happened on the plain of Nisa. There it was that the Lord who receives many guests made his lunge. He was riding on a chariot drawn by immortal horses, the son of Kronos, the one known by many names. He seized her against her will, put her on his golden chariot, and drove away as she wept. She cried with a piercing voice, calling upon her father Zeus, the son of Kronos, the highest and best, but not one of the immortals, or of human mortals, heard her voice. Not even the olive trees, which bear their splendid harvest except for the daughter of Perseus, the one who keeps in mind the vigor of nature. She heard it from her cave. She is Hecate with the splendid headband, and the Lord Helios, the sun, heard it too, the magnificent son of Hyperion. They heard the daughter calling upon her father, the son of Kronos. But he, all by himself, was seated far apart from the gods, inside a temple, the precinct of many prayers. He was receiving beautiful sacrificial rites from mortal humans. She, 
was being taken against her will at the behest of Zeus by her father's brother, the one who makes many semata seeds, the one who receives many guests, the son of Kronos, the one with many names. On the chariot drawn by immortal horses, so long as the earth and the star-filled sky were within the goddess's view, as also the fish-swarming sea with its strong currents, as also the rays of the sun, she still had hope that she would yet see her dear mother and that special group, the immortal gods. For that long a time her great mind was soothed by hope, distressed as she was, the peaks of the mountain resounded, as did the depths of the sea with her immortal voice. And the Lady Mother, Demeter, heard her, and a sharp pain seized her heart. The headband on her hair she tore off with her own immortal hands, and threw a dark cloak over her shoulder. She sped off like a bird, soaring over land and sea, looking and looking, but no one was willing to tell her the truth. Not one of the gods, not one of the mortal humans, not one of the birds, the messengers of truth. Thereafter, for nine days, did the Lady Demeter wander all over the earth, holding torches ablaze in her hand. Not once did she take of ambrosia and nectar, sweet to drink, in her grief nor did she bathe her skin in water. But when the tenth bright dawn came upon her, Hecate came to her, holding a light ablaze in her hand. She came with a message, and she spoke up, saying to her, Lady Demeter, bringer of Horai, giver of splendid gifts, which of the gods who dwell in the sky, or which one of the mortal humans seized Persephone and brought grief to your Philos Thumos, your beloved heart? I heard the sounds, but I did not see with my eyes who it was, so I quickly came to tell you everything without error. So spoke Hecate but she was not answered by the daughter of Rhea with beautiful hair. Instead, she, Demeter, joined her, Hecate, and quickly set out with her, holding torches ablaze in her hands. They came to Helios, the seeing eye of gods and men. They stood in front of his chariot team, and the resplendent goddess asked this question. Helios! Show me respect, God to goddess, if ever I have pleased your heart and thumos, which is heart again. If ever I have pleased your heart in word or deed, it is about the girl born to me, a sweet young seedling renowned for her beauty, whose piercing cry I heard resounding through the boundless ether, as if she were being forced though I did not see it with my eyes. I turn to you as one who ranges all over the earth and sea, as you look down from the bright ether with your sunbeams. Tell me without error whether you have by any chance seen my beloved child, and who has taken her away from me by force against her will and then gone away. Tell me which one of the gods or mortals did this. So she spoke, and the son of Hyperion answered with these words, Daughter of Rhea with the beautiful hair, Queen Demeter, you shall know the answer, for greatly I respect you and feel sorry for you, as you grieve over your child, the one with delicate ankles. No one else among all of the immortals is responsible except the cloud-gatherer Zeus himself, who gave her to Hades as his beautiful wife.
So he gave her to his own brother, and he, Hades, heading for the misty realms of darkness, seized her as he drove his chariot and as she screamed aloud. But I urge you, goddess, stop your loud cry of lamentation. You should not have an anger without bounds, all in vain. It is not unseemly to have, of all the immortals, such as a son-in-law as Hades, the one who makes the many seeds. He is the brother of Zeus, whose seed is from the same place, and as for honor, he has his share, going back to the very beginning, and when three-way division of inheritance was made, he dwells with those whose king he was destined by lot to be. So saying, he shouted to his horse and responded to his command, as they swiftly drew the speeding chariot like long-winged birds. And she, Demeter, was visited by a grief that was even more terrible than before. It makes you think of the Hound of Hades. In her anger at the one who is known for his dark clouds, the son of Kronos, she shunned the company of the gods and of lofty Olympus. She went away, visiting the cities of humans with all her fertile land holdings, shading over her appearance for a long time, and not one of men looking at her, could recognize her. Not one of women, either, who are accustomed to wear their girdles low-strung. Until one day she came to the house of bright-minded Keleos, who was at that time the ruler of Eleusis, fragrant with incense. She sat down near the road, sad in her beloved heart, at the well called the Parthenion, where the people of the polis used to draw water. She sat in the shade under the thick growth of an olive tree, looking like an old woman who had lived through many years and who was deprived of giving childbirth and of the gifts of Aphrodite, lover of garlands in the hair. All right, so uh, here's where there's a long section I've cut out describing how Demeter is taken in among the people of Eleusis, where she integrates and serves as a wet nurse to a child in all her grief. Uh, she tries to make the child immortal through some kind of ritual, but uh, his mother catches Demeter, passing the child through a flame. The mother freaks out and Demeter leaves, uh, but not without making it known that they'd wronged the goddess, and so... She puts a curse on everybody, and they build a giant temple to appease her, uh, but this didn't help, and uh, that's because Persephone is still lost in the underworld. So, here we go again. Uh, they built it as he ordered, and the temple grew bigger and bigger, taking shape through the dispensation of the daimon, the spirit. When the people had finished their work and paused from their labor, they all went home, but blonde-haired Demeter sat down and stayed there in the temple, shunning the company of the Blessed Ones. She was wasting away with her yearning for her daughter with the low-strung girdle. She made that year the most terrible one for mortals all over the earth nurturer of many. It was so terrible, it makes you think of the hounds of Hades. The earth did not send up any seed. Demeter, she with the beautiful garlands in her hair, kept them covered underground. Many a curved plow was dragged along the fields by many an ox, all in vain. Many a bright grain of wheat fell into the earth, all for naught. At this moment, she, Demeter, could have destroyed the entire race of humans with harsh hunger, thus depriving the gods of their reverence. The sacrificial portions of meat for eating or for burning. 
if Zeus had not noticed with his mind, taking note in his heart. First he sent Iris with the golden wings to summon Demeter with the splendid hair, with a beauty that is much loved. That is, what he told her to do. And she obeyed Zeus, the one with the dark clouds, the son of Kronos, and she ran the space between the sky and earth quickly with her feet. She arrived at the great city of Eleusis, fragrant with incense, and she found in the temple of Demeter the one with the dark robe. Addressing her, she spoke with winged words, Demeter, Zeus, the one who has unwilting knowledge, summons you to come to that special group, the company of the immortal gods. So then come. May what my words say, which come from Zeus, not fail to be turned into action that is completed. So she spoke, making an entreaty. But Demeter's heart was not persuaded. After that, the father sent out all of the other blessed and immortal gods. They came one by one. They kept calling out to her, offering her many beautiful gifts, all sorts of timai, honors, that she could choose for herself if she joined the company of the immortal gods. But no one could persuade her in her thinking or in her intentions, angry as she was in her heart, and she harshly said no to their words. She said that she would never go to fragrant Olympus, that she would never send up a harvest of the earth, until she saw with her own eyes her daughter, the one with the beautiful looks. But when the loud thunderer, the one who sees far and wide, heard this, he sent to Erebos, the one with the golden wand, the Argos killer, Hermes, so that he may persuade Hades with gentle words, that he allow holy Persephone to leave the misty realms of darkness and be brought to the light in order to join the Daimones, the gods in Olympus, so that her mother may see her with her own eyes and let go of her anger. Hermes did not disobey, but straight away he headed down beneath the depths of the earth, rushing full speed, leaving behind the abode of Olympus, and he found the lord inside his palace, seated on a funeral couch, along with his duly acquired bedmate, the one who was much under duress, yearning for her mother and suffering from the unbearable things inflicted upon her by the will of the Blessed Ones. Going near him and stopping, the powerful Argos killer said to Hades, Hades, dark-haired one, king of the dead, Zeus, the father, orders that I have splendid Persephone brought back up to the light from Erebos, back to him and his company, so that her mother may see with her own eyes and let go of her wrath and terrible anger against the immortals. For she, Demeter, is performing a mighty deed to destroy the tribes of the earthborn humans causing them to be without food by hiding the seed underground, and she is destroying the very honors of the gods. She has terrible anger, and she refuses to keep with the company of the gods. Instead, far removed, she's seated inside a temple fragrant with incense. She has taken charge of the rocky citadel of Eleusis. So he spoke. Hades, king of the dead, smiled with his brows, and he did not disobey the order of Zeus the king. Swiftly he gave an order to bright-minded Persephone, Go, Persephone, to your mother, the one with the dark robe. Have a kindly disposition and a, and a heart in your breast. Do not be upset excessively so. I will not be an unseemly husband to you in the company of the immortals. I am the brother of Zeus, the father. If you are here, you will be queen of everything that lives and moves about, and you will have the greatest honor in the company of the immortals. 
those who violate law will get punishment for all days to come. Those who do not supplicate your menos with sacrifice, performing the rituals in a reverent way, executing perfectly the offerings that are due. So he spoke, and high-minded Persephone rejoiced. Swiftly she set out with joy, but he, Hades, gave her stealthily the honey-sweet berry of the pomegranate to eat, peering around him. He did not want her to stay for all time over there at the side of her honorable mother, the one with the dark robe. The immortal horses were harnessed to the golden chariot by Hades, the one who makes many seeds. She got up on the chariot, and next to her was the powerful Argos killer, who took reins and whip into his beloved hands and shot out the palace of Hades. And the horses sped away eagerly. Swiftly they made their way along the long journey. Neither the sea nor the water of the rivers nor the grassy valleys, nor the mountain peaks could hold the onrush of the immortal horses. High over the peaks they went, slicing through the vast air. He came to a halt at the place where Demeter, with the beautiful garlands in her hair, was staying at the forefront of the temple, fragrant with incense. When she, Demeter, saw them, she rushed forth like a menad down a wooded mountain slope. But when the earth starts blossoming with fragrant flowers of springtime, flowers of every sort, then it is that you must come up from the misty realm of darkness once again. All right, and now I've excised a few lines here. I'm going to take up at line 401. But when the earth starts blossoming with fragrant flowers of springtime, flowers of every sort, then it is that you must come up from the misty realms of darkness, once again a great thing of wonder to gods and mortal humans alike. But what kind of ruse was used to deceive you by the powerful one, the one who receives many guests? She, Demeter, was answered by Persephone, the most beautiful. So then, mother, I shall tell you everything without error. When the messenger came to me, the swift Argus killer, with the news from my father, the son of Kronos, and from other dwellers in the sky, that I should come from Erebos, so that you may see me with your own eyes and let go of your wrath, your terrible anger against the immortals, then... I sprang up for joy, but he, stealthily, put into my hand the berry of the pomegranate, that honey-sweet food, and he compelled me, by force, to eat it. Now I'm skipping a few lines ahead. We were playing and gathering lovely flowers in our hands, an assortment of delicate crocus and iris and hyacinth, rosebuds and lilies, a wonder to behold, and the narcissus which is grown like the crocus by the wide earth. I was joyfully gathering these flowers, and then the earth beneath me gave way, and there it was, and there it was that he sprang out, the powerful lord who receives many guests. He took me away under his earth, in his golden chariot. It was very much against my will. I cried with a piercing voice, these things, grieving, I tell you, and they are all the truth. In this way did the two of them spend the whole day, having a like-minded heart, and they gladdened greatly in each other's hearts, hugging each other, and their hearts ceased from aching, they received joy from each other and gave it. Then Hecate approached them, the one with a splendid headband, and she welcomed back the daughter of holy Demeter with many embraces. And from that day forward, the lady Hecate became Persephone's attendant and substitute queen. Then, 
the loud thundering Zeus, who sees far and wide, sent to them a messenger, Rhea with the beautiful hair, to bring Demeter, the one with the dark robe, to join the company of the special group of gods. And he promised many honors that he would give to Demeter, which she could receive in the company of the immortal gods. He, Zeus, assented that her daughter, every time the season came round, would spend a third portion of the year in the realms of dark mist underneath, and the other two-thirds in the company of her mother and the other immortals. So he spoke, and the goddess Rhea did not disobey the messages of Zeus. And I'll stop there. Now, as you can probably see, the traditional view of death among the Greeks of the Homeric age was painted in a rather pessimistic light. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, Hades was a house of dusty shades. The deceased Achilles laments to Odysseus, O oh, shining Odysseus, never try to console me for dying, for I would rather follow the plough as a thrall to another man, one with no land allotted to him and not much to live on, than to be king over all the perished dead. From the Thracians, perhaps, the Indo-European barbarian peoples just north of Greece, these were actually the ancestral lands of the Trojan slash Phrygian peoples, in case you wondered uh, how Achaeans and the Trojans could talk with one another. Or perhaps from Egypt or India, or probably as an indigenous development, which was later externally attributed, the Greeks got this idea that the soul was no different than the crops. There gradually developed a number of spiritual doctrines, first regarding the existence of a soul altogether, and then regarding the soul's immortality and the hope for a beatific life after death. We've been talking a lot about the development of soteriological thinking in our time together. So-called Orphic thought, which was later taken up by the Pythagoreans, uh, reformed Dionysian myth and ritual to include a soteriological system once the Greeks had established colonies around the Black Sea and began their cultural exchange with the Thracians. One Orphic bone inscription from Olbia, uh, dated to the 5th century BC, reads, For Dionysus and Psyche, or Psyche, revealing the importance of a transcendental soul in connection with the Greek god of intoxication in Thracian territory. This is also indicative of another version of the famous uh, Cupid and Psyche catabasis myth, which lies at the root of our Beauty and the Beast, uh, wherein Dionysus replaces Cupid, Desire, as Psyche's lover. Um, another one of these bone inscriptions containing the words Bios, Thanatos, Bios, and marked with little zigzaggy Z pictograms uh, that might represent little serpents, reveals the widespread and consistent nature of Dionysian symbolism in regards to cyclical nature uh, reaching as far north as modern Ukraine. Now, in the shamanic mystery initiations as practiced by the Orphic cults, it's quite likely that incubation, near-death experiences, and the use of dangerous doses of hallucinogenic plants went hand in hand. Uh, whereas the divine bridegroom Sabazios, or, uh, who's kind of a Thracian form of Dionysus, Whereas he was primarily the god who presided over ecstasy and entheogenic intoxication, uh, the Thracians held him in equally high regard as the dying and rising god and master over the souls of the deceased. Among the most famous of the uh, quote-unquote medicine men of Thrace, who revered the god of intoxication above all, and who famously underwent catabatheus of their own, were the mythic bard Orpheus, the subterranean initiator 
Zalmoxis, the Warden of Divine Wine Maro, and the Chthonic King Rhesus. Uh, I've spoken of these individuals elsewhere, uh, but this is a good place to refresh your memories. Now, most writers of antiquity actually believe in the historical veracity of Orpheus, although his lifetime stretched back into the dimness of legend. Uh, E.R. Dodds, the great scholar of Greek irrationality, held Dionysus to be, quote, a Thracian figure of much the same kind as Zalmoxis, a mythical shaman or prototype of shamans. So Orpheus was both noble and semi-divine. He was a, a prince, being the son of the muse Calliope and the Euhemerized king Oegrius, who was a Thracian wine god. Uh, in some other accounts, he was a son of Apollo, a god of healing, music, and prophecy. And now, whether or not we should take this at face value is another issue altogether, but some guy we call Pseudo-Apollodorus accredits Orpheus with the invention of of the Dionysian mysteries themselves. That secret cult of women established around sacred marriage and entheogenic intoxication. And I think this is important. Uh, Strabo buttresses this claim, telling us that the rites of Orpheus first originated among the Cotitian and the Bendidaean rites, as practiced among the Thracians. Uh, he adds that these rites resemble the Phrygian rites, Makes sense. And it is at least not likely that, just as the Phrygians themselves were colonists from Thrace, which is true, so also their sacred rites were borrowed from there. Now, Orpheus was reputed to have traveled widely, proselytizing the sacred doctrines of the goddess and her divine bridegroom throughout the lands he wandered, but what were those sacred doctrines? Well, we don't really know, uh, but it's probable that this Orpheus character would have represented a class of people rather than one individual, sort of like Homer, uh, who, who were not unlike the Metragirtai of Kabylie, these wandering mendicants who proselytize some kind of lost and found death and resurrection goddess myth and its associated mysteries. So, for example, in Aegina, Orpheus is said to have established the rites of Hecate, and in Laconia, he introduced the quasi-Eleusinian rites of Demeter Chthonia, the subterranean mother, both of which were centered on the erection of a wooden image. Now, the shamanic character of Orpheus is very well attested amongst both ancient and modern sources. He was uh, simultaneously a prince, a prophet, a healer, a magician, a guardian of ecstatic mysteries. Uh, he possessed the ability to charm wild beasts and to control natural phenomena. Uh, he performed this catabasis, this descent into the underworld, on account of a spiritual quest to return the soul of his beloved Eurydice from Hades and Proserpina. And even his decapitated head was a source of oracular power, having been severed by Dionysus' maenads for having embraced solar monotheism at the end of his life. Orpheus' decapitated head was basically used as an oracle in the same way the Yukagir shaman used skulls, or, or the head of Mimir, which Odin uses to divulge information about other realms in the Heimskringla. Ultimately, the importance of Orpheus lay predominantly in rites which he established, which were said to affirm the immortality of the soul. Reincarnation, or metempsychosis in the Greek tradition. This is more or less the only thing we can say with any certainty that the Orphics and the Pythagoreans believed in. The mysteries of Dionysus and its associated myths, as embodied in the ostensibly savage rites of the Maenads in Euripides' Bacchae, were born out of a long mythico-religious tradition stretching back into the Paleolithic, with shamanism and orgiastic goddess worship. But 
it was probably the Orphic movement based out of Thrace, which took this marginalized, female-dominated cult and then brought it into the fold of the quote-unquote civilized and the masculine uh, into Greek philosophy. So this was all happening slowly from about the 8th century BC to about the 5th century BC. Uh, the poet and, and translator uh, Robert Graves was very interested in this issue during his lifetime. But ultimately, uh, in Orpheus, we have the embodiment of the masculine Thracian heroic ideal. He's a noble priest king, skilled in magical arts, and the founder of an ecstatic god's sacred rites. He's the model candidate for immortality. Rhesus, a Thracian king, literally his name means king, uh, like the Indo-European Raj or Ri in Irish or Rex in Latin, uh, Rhesus is just king in Thracian. Uh, this guy appears in the Iliad and in a tragedy attributed to Euripides, and he exhibits many of the archetypes that I've defined as the ideal Thracian man. Uh, in Euripides' tragedy, uh, a messenger proclaims to Hector, I see Rhesus mounted like a god upon his Thracian chariot. Of gold was the yoke that linked the necks of his steeds whiter than snow, and on his shoulders flashed his targe with figures welded in gold. He was the son of a river god and a muse, and during his life he exhibited godlike skills in war. He had a passion for gold and horses, and mystery rites imparted by Orpheus, the prophet of Bacchus. Uh, upon his death, Rhesus didn't descend into Hades for a life of bleak wandering and forgetfulness, but instead he achieved a kind of chthonic godhood. The Thracian king's mother, an unnamed muse, declared that, quote, he shall not descend into earth's darksome soil. So earnest a prayer will I address to the bride of the netherworld, the daughter of the goddess Demeter, giver of increase, to release his soul. And debtor as she is to me, show that she honored the friends of Orpheus. Yet from henceforth will he be to me as one dead that seeth not the light. For never again will he meet me or see his mother's face, but will lurk hidden in a cavern of the land with veins of silver, restored to life, no longer man but God, even as did the prophet of Bacchus dwell in a grotto beneath Pangaeus, a god whom his votaries honored. In any case, I'm, I'm showing you this to indicate how the Greek conceptualization of the Thracians was set in the idea that immortality came to those who underwent some sort of Orphic initiation. You know, there is no salvation outside of initiation. The Orphics, by way of the Pythagoreans, and the Pythagoreans, by way of the Platonists, then doubtless played an incalculable role in priming the Greco-Roman world for the breakdown of the polis, the rise of the individual, and the rise of manifold mystical philosophies, and the new soteriological dimensions of religion. No more were people looking to carve out a place in this world by the Hellenistic era. They needed to be saved from it. The catabasis and the anabasis are indispensable factors to this mass reconceptualization of the world, whether for good or for ill. Uh, if you have not fallen, you cannot be lifted up. If you have not died, you cannot be reborn. Well, all right. I suppose talking about Thrace makes for a nice segue to talk about Ovid, since he was famously exiled to Thracian lands in modern Romania after being exposed, along with a great number of other men, for a series of indiscretions with Augustus' daughter. In Ovid's poetic collection of mythological stories, he includes accounts of Catabaseus as well. Uh, in Book 4, Juno descends into Hades, not unlike Ishtar or Inanna did 
millennia before her. Ovid describes Cerberus, the Furies, and so forth while in the underworld. Uh, Juno passes several famous souls who are being punished in Hades. So you've got Tantalus parched with thirst, and Sisyphus pushing his rock, and Ixion spitting on his wheel, and this kind of thing. Uh, seeing the souls of the wicked being punished in hell. It was a trope that would long endure, and everyone from Homer to Dante just delighted in describing these episodes. I'm reminded of William Blake's famous words concerning the literary titan John Milton. Uh, quote, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet, and of the devil's party, without knowing it. Well, the fact is, hell and chaos is the wellspring of unbridled creativity, whereas heaven is orderly and perfect and in no need of additional creativity. So, you know, this all seems to check out to me. So the next major catabasis in the Metamorphoses uh, occurs in Book 5 by Proserpina, uh, the daughter of Ceres, who's kidnapped by Dis. We've literally just gone over this in the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, which was obviously one of of its sources. He's just given his own account in Latin meter with all of the equivalent Latin names. So for the uninitiated, uh, Proserpina is Core slash Persephone, uh, Ceres is Demeter, and Dis is Hades. Now, Ovid briefly mentions the uh, catabasis of Hercules in Book 7. He tells the story behind the sorceress Medea's poison for Theseus, during which Hercules travels to the underworld, past the gates of death and sleep, to capture Cerberus as one of his twelve labors. But this infernal three-headed dog spreads a, a white foam from his mouth, which grew poisonous plants. This is a pretty common motif in the ancient world, whether in the Near East or around the Mediterranean, and that is that poison plants and the underworld are thematically linked. Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> Well, obviously they grow out of the earth, and they draw from the earth, but if you take them, you can either be killed or transported to what was ostensibly the threshold of death, which was an area populated by all manner of specters and frightening hallucinations. Uh, the, the catabasis of Orpheus is again featured in Book 10 in Ovid, and uh, it's the last major inclusion of the motif uh, in the entire poem. So again... Orpheus, distressed by the death of his wife Eurydice, he enters the underworld and visits Dis and Proserpina to beg for her return. Uh, overcome by Orpheus's warm lyre playing, Proserpina permits Eurydice to leave with her husband on the condition that he doesn't look back until they reach an exit, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah style. Uh, While well, the fact is, he does look back and his wife disappears and all his toils are in vain. Now, as far as the Romans are concerned, probably the most famous catabasis motif, and definitely the one that inspired Dante, was the one which appears in the Aeneid of Virgil. I suppose it only now just dawned on me that technically Aeneas is a Thracian princeling of sorts too. Uh, now, after Troy was destroyed in its last battle against the Achaeans, Aeneas left the burning wreckage of his city and began to quest to find a new home. Now, after being racked with many sorrows and tribulations, uh, Aeneas arrived in Italy, where he envisioned founding a race destined for greatness. Now, in Cumae, at the Temple of Apollo, the Sibylline Oracle, an old woman purported to be over 700 years old, agrees to escort him on a chthonic journey into the underworld in order that he might see the shade of his dead father. Now before entering Hades, the oracle tells Aeneas he must obtain the golden bough. It's a golden branch from a tree that grew nearby in the woods around her cave, which I actually suspect is a mushroom, but I won't get into that here, especially since, like Moses in the burning bush, Aeneas isn't a real historical person. Now, this golden bough Aeneas is supposed to give as a gift to Proserpina. Aeneas's mother, uh, the goddess Venus, sends two doves to aid him in this difficult task. 
Doves are traditionally associated with Anabases. Well, serpents are traditionally associated with the Catabasis. Uh, and these uh, help him find the tree with the golden bough. Now, when Aeneas tears off the branch, a second one springs up straight away, which is a good omen. And shortly after they begin their descent, the Sibyl shows the golden bough to Charon, the boatman, who considers it a payment and allows them to enter his boat and cross the Stygian River. On the other side of Styx, the Sibyl uses her typical knowledge of soporific plants to sedate Cerberus. Once in the underworld proper, uh, Aeneas tries talking to some shades in vain, and he listens to the Sibyl speak of places like Tartarus, where uh, he beholds a tremendous prison fenced in by high threefold walls, wherein the wicked are being eternally punished, and that sort of thing. In the House of Hades itself, in Pluto's palace, Aeneas places the golden bough on the arched door and goes through the blessed Elysian fields. It's a kind of pocket plain within hell where dwell the men who lived just and useful lives, sort of like uh, Rhesus was just described as being inside of. Now, this is where Anchises, the father of dutiful Aeneas, was finally found, and he's there in lush and verdant Elysium by the beautiful river Eridanus. Uh, there, Aeneas tries to hug his father three times, but sort of like in an empty dream, his father's shade couldn't be touched. Now, despite this, they manage to have a you know, meta-dimensional chat, and Anchises tells his son about the nearby river Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, something I'm sure many of you have crossed on your way back from your own underworld descents. Now, in the Aeneid, on the other side of the river, there's actually a multitude of spirits waiting to be born on Earth. Hopefully this reminds you a bit of Plato's myth of air I mentioned earlier. Uh, the underworld has all these kind of like tubes and tunnels jutting off into different directions for different souls. And from across the river, Aeneas sees his very own descendants, those who would live in the future. Uh, so people like Romulus and the Caesars. Let's never forget that the Aeneid, much like Dante's Inferno, is as much a piece of political propaganda as it is a journey of the soul. You know, there's some nice ekphrasis and so on and so forth, but at this point Anchises gives Aeneas advice and leads him to the ivory gate of sleep, as opposed to the gate of death, and through which they return to reality, or earth, or whatever you want to call re-embodiment. All right, so there are countless other examples, and I've already gone well over my time, and there's really much more to be said on the subject, but uh, I don't have more time to delve into this today. Uh, I suppose the least I can do before leaving you is tell you how this relates to Hermeticism. While Hermes was the psychopomp, a fancy word which elides the two Greek words psuche, soul, and pompos, guide, When Demeter wants to get Persephone back from the underworld, she sends Hermes. He's the intermediary, like the Ningazita of the Grecian mother. They even share the same symbol, the Caduceus. But even this is a mainly superficial connection. What's important is the motif of the journey of the soul. This is a shamanic motif. It goes back far beyond written record, and it is central to humanity's understanding of a soul. The idea was that if you were in a society which prized the body above all things, such as like a pagan Greek society where, if you remember, people were conceptualized as the sum of their limbs, uh, but then you could ostensibly leave this body and then travel to other realms without it, then there must be some kind of kernel, some kind of divine spark at the center of man, which was independent from the body. Now, whether this is true or not is something we'll continue to explore together, but interest in this divine spark would begin to ramp up significantly between, say, the 3rd century BC and the 3rd century AD. 
and all kinds of mystical literature around the subject, whether Jewish, Greek, Latin, Egyptian, Indian, or whatever, would proliferate. And the writing of the Stoics, the Gnostics, the Neoplatonists, the Hermeticists, and so forth, they would all tap into this current, and they would all elaborate on it, debate it, and, and such that it would be appropriate to say that out of the axial age, this age of great spiritual teachers, came the age of the soul, where the individual consciousness, in its irreducibility, became the most important subject of philosophical inquiry. You know, it wasn't about the polis, or it wasn't about justice, it wasn't about state organization or anything like that. People were looking inward and they wanted to know, what about the soul? What about consciousness? So these are all things that we'll discuss in the future in more detail. And when we come back, we'll talk about the anabasis, the ascent into heaven motif, which goes hand in hand, like yin and yang, with the catabasis motif. And was just as vital to this question about the soul as its negative counterpart. Until then, hopefully this can be a kind of springboard into thinking about this very long and beautiful thread which runs through the Western canon. For now, you've been listening to Encyclopedia Hermetica, Big History, and I'm Dan Attrell.